deliberate, which means on purpose, to do things on purpose. Josh, when you went to college in Tulsa, it was deliberate. It wasn't something you just fell into. You mean it's important to do things that are deliberate. You can't have a memorial without sacrifice, and you can't have a sacrifice without love. One of the things I want to hit here tonight is uh, you just stay with the flow of what we've been doing on Sunday. We dealt with sacrifice, and yesterday we dealt with sacrifice. Amen. And again, and, uh, and I thank God for those of you that showed up out at the memorial. I think I've been doing that for 15 years over there, and I have asked them to find somebody else, and they just think that I, I'm just a really good bargain because every time I get that offering check, I can tell they think I'm a really good bargain. I, wa I was almost walked over to the, uh, to the bugle player and the, uh, and the uh, bagpipe guy and said, how much y'all get? And I know that's wrong. You don't do it for the money. And I've never done it for the money. But it is it's just kind of funny. They say, we just know about you. And they've they got a whole new group of people there. But they still call me in. You know, we talked about on this weekend at a memorial, something that keeps remembrance alive, memory stones. For our nation, the Memorial Day was celebrated. And I, I believe a lot of people. And what, made, what blessed me, I knew we had people out. And people plan to be out for the holidays. I know that. And I don't condemn or throw stones to anyone for doing that. But I thank God for those that said, you know what, we, we're not going out anywhere. We're going to go to church on Sunday, and we're going to celebrate. And not only that, we're going to commensurate in memory, amen, those who have fallen in action. Winston Churchill once said, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. On Sunday morning, I took a, a group of people around with me that showed up from Oklahoma City. They were a, a part of Bishop Miller's church and uh, just friends of ours, and they just popped in, and uh, Felix and Kay, and, and it was kind of a, a neat thing for me because I rode motorcycles with them, but I got to take them around the property. And as I was taking them around the property, they asked questions, and I, and I would bring it up. Well, that somebody left that there. That bench came from somebody who used to work here. That cross came from somebody who used to work here. Amen. People were involved here, and, and they left something. They left a legacy here. So, again, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. Einstein actually said something smart when he said, the value of a man resides in what he gives and not what he receives. The greatest men and women of history, those that will be remembered for generations, make their mark on this earth through their generosity of spirit their willingness to sacrifice themselves for the betterment of their society and the people around them and those in need. Now, I'm going to say that to you again because it's, it's, it's kind of rich, but it also speaks of what we are here to do and what we are here to leave. But the greatest men and women in history, those that will be remembered for generations. When I say a generation, I'm talking about 40 years, 80 years, 120 years. They made their mark on this earth through their generosity of spirit, their willingness to sacrifice themselves, and for the betterment of society, the people around them, and those in need. God's presence is always in the hands of generosity. Anytime there's the presence of God, there's going to be generosity in the house. Always works that way. I'm going to keep move, proving that to you. So where the presence of God is, the spirit of generosity is. Generosity simply means characterized by a noble spirit, liberal and given, marked by abundant proportions. I was reading this uh, passage this morning, and it hit me that we compare ourselves to others so often. We say, well, we're not like Baptists. We're not like Pentecostals. And I'm not speaking about the little country church per se, but I'm just talking about people in general. We look at other people and say, well, you know what? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a better Christian than this one here. But when you compare yourself to the Word of God, Amen. that's where everything changes. Amen. And in my life today, when, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, I don't love you. Not like I'm supposed to love you. I don't give the way I'm supposed to love you. I don't worship the way I'm supposed to love you. I don't fast the way I'm supposed to love you. I mean, I'm looking at the Word of God and realizing that I have fallen short. And so as I walk through this tonight, I'm reaching for those that are online also. But I want you to catch this. And if we don't catch it tonight, I'll preach it again on Sunday. Come on. I just feel that way, that much about it. Watch this. John chapter 12. It's a deliberate. Everybody say a deliberate. Action. One more time, a deliberate, deliberate action. Sometimes we do things, you know, and it wasn't deliberate, but it turns out good. <laughs> Thank God for that. But a lot of times we have to be the initiators to make it happen. Six days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany where Lazarus, so recently raised from the dead, was living. 
Now, again, I love this, that after his resurrection from the dead, Lazarus, Jesus showed back up to visit him. I, I, I love to visit. I love to hang out with people. Of course, I was with a family on, on Saturday, and the man passed away two hours after I left him. You know, I was with my mother-in-law uh, on a Wednesday. She passed away on a Saturday. Maybe you don't want me to visit you. But either way, it was still a gift to me to be with people before they passed and to have that, that honor. So here's Lazarus raised from the dead. Amen. And here Jesus shows up, verse 2. Lazarus and his sisters, they invited Jesus to dinner at their home. Guess who served? Martha. Of course she did. Amen. Lazarus was one of those sitting at the table with them. When Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, she poured it on Jesus' feet, and she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, again, you've got to imagine that her hair was up because that's how, tr traditionally how the women kept their hair. They kept it up. The other thing, traditionally, women never ate with the men. And so she's in the kitchen, but she breaks protocol. And this is where I, you see real true love. She breaks protocol at this moment, pulls the pins out of her hair, allows it to flow, and she takes this ointment, amen, this expensive perfume, the Scripture calls it, and she puts it all over his feet, and the house was filled with the fragrance of it. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, even when, even then getting ready to betray him, said, now so notice, so you got Lazarus, you got Mary, you got Martha, and you got 12 disciples all in the house, and Martha's servant, she's preparing food for them. As she's preparing for them, Judas was a little upset, and he said, why was it this, so, this oil sold and the money given to the poor? It would have easily brought 300 uh, silver pieces. He said this not because he cared two cents about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of their common funds, but also embezzled them. Jesus said, let her alone. He knew, Jesus knew about Judas, but he didn't bother him except to say to him, let her alone. She's anticipating an honor in the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you. You don't always have me. It almost sounds offensive to say, hey, you always got the poor, because we deal with that today in America and other countries. Hey, you always, the poor is always there, but you don't always have an opportunity to do something for Jesus. That's what this is about here. So when I'm reading this, I realize there's Mary. You've got to look at who's all there. I've often called this here group, uh, the characters of the story, you know, a grateful woman and the grateful dead. How do you know that Lazarus was the grateful dead? He's an original grateful dead. He's got to be great. And who knows what he saw on the other side, but he's hanging out with Jesus. And there's Mary, the consummate worshipers there. A vase breaks. It's an empty box. And then worship begins to affect the atmosphere. And I'm going to say this to you again. Your worship affects the atmosphere. I love being on the front row. I just like being up close to the front. Because I, I, there are times I hear people behind me, but if I don't, I'm still going to worship. Amen. I'm going to still see the atmosphere shift and some things change. Change. Commitment, the anointing was a sacrificial gift. It was a commitment beyond common sense. It, it, it was something that you would rarely see happen. And I, I don't think you should do it every Sunday. I don't think it should happen every time you come to church. But I think sometime in your lifetime, you need to do something extravagant. You need to do something extravagant for God, for the kingdom of God, for the people of God, for the house of God. You just got to do something. You got to break. I, I use the term break a vase. You got to break a vase. You got to do some change in here. The, the anointing was sacrificial. According to Webster's Dictionary, a sacrifice means the surrender or destruction of something prized or desirable for the sake of something considered as having a higher or more pressing claim. She felt, now I, 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 took, I brought something. Some of you may find this bottle familiar. This smells like my dad. If I want my dad, Ken, this is my dad. I break this vase, I open this up, and it'll smell just like pop. I mean, cause it, so he said, well, that's probably the cheapest cologne you can get, Pastor. Like I said, it smells like my dad. Come on. And that's what he wore. Amen. He often... There it is. There's no getting away from it. There's no getting away from that smell there. Now, I want you to hear this again. She considered sacrifice, the surrender or destruction or something prized or desirable for the sake of something considered as having a higher or more pressing claim. The anointing, my friend, was sacrificial. It was worth 300 pieces of silver. 
it's worth a, 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 literally a year's wages. Whatever you think you make, if you make 50000 100000 200000 a year, that's how much that one jar of perfume was worth. So the value of the perfume was costly, amen. And again, here she is. The perfume was precious. It was a precious item to Eastern women. Mary was taking a most precious possession and giving it to her Lord. The anointing was a commitment, amen, she made. Imagine the scene. A bottle of perfume worth a whole year's wages being broken and poured upon the head of Christ. A broken bottle, you can't get it back in. It's not that the lid's off, the bottle's broke. You can't get it back into the bottle. It's, it's past tense. It's, it's over with. Amen. So, so here, the, a man rose up and said, hey, you need to sell it. You could use the money for the poor, the hungry, the homeless. This is just what the disciples did. And in fact, they were ignorant and vexed about it. They were bothered about it. She had, I love when people have insight. I do. Today on the news, it said that uh, one of the largest meatpacking companies in America was just hit with a Russian virus, just like Continental, the uh, oil company, was hit and lost all that oil between here and New York, and they had to pay millions of dollars ransomware to get it taken down. So JBS was just hit. JBS is the company my daughter used to work for, and she rode horses and worked cows and big cattle lots up there. Well, now they should. So the meat price is fixing to go up. And here I sit with a freezer full <laughs> of deer meat, and a cow that I bought from a friend a few months, about a month ago. So I'm smiling because I know the price of meat's going up. I might go into business. <laughs> but here's the, th here's the thing, isn't it, guys, is that to be able to see. And she saw something nobody else saw. She saw his burial coming up. She listened to him. They may have heard, but she listened. And she caught some things about him. So the disciples failed to see the point. Let's first see what they failed to see. That Mary was driven to express her faith in her Lord and her love for him personally. I'm not going to let somebody else do it. Amen. I'm going to do this personally. The most meaningful way she could do this was to anoint him as her Lord with the most expensive perfume she possessed. This is memorial. This is about Memorial Day. We talked about people who gave their lives for freedom, what Christ did for our freedom. The most significant person in Mary's life was her Lord. And this is why I sit back and go, God, I love a lot of things in life, but I need to love you more. I really need to love you more. It's true sin sacrifice. Amen. Uh, true love sacrifices itself, a commitment beyond common sense. It gives of itself. All that one is and has. Love is not really shown when we give only what we can afford. If I just give what I can afford, I'm not really showing love. Amen. I'm giving what I can afford. It is when we sacrifice, dig deep into our lives. And, I, and, and I'll say it. It could be your time, your talent, your money. Amen. Whatever you give of yourself, all we are and have that we really show the love and more sacrifice. And the more that we demonstrate our love. Some are willing to give that they do not have. Judas called it waste. He said, she's wasteful. She's wasting this. We could, we could sow this and gave it to the poor. What he called waste, Jesus called worship. Amen. You think that's what? This is about worship, man. This story tells us a great deal about the love which delights the heart of Jesus. In other words, something you can't get back in the bottle. Something that's got to be broken and released. What the disciples fail to see is there's a certain extravagance in love. The alabaster jar perfume was meant to be used drop by drop. Now, it's got a little spray shot here. Amen. If I went around the room and I just started giving just a little squirt, well, that's one thing. Oh, yeah, in a minute, it'll drift to you. It'll get there. Oh, I can smell it already. Oh, man, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It just, it's just, just a little squirt here. A little squirt there. Maybe just a little, just a little bit. It's all you need. But she, it, that, it, it was supposed to last literally a lifetime. Years ago, David, David Huff sent me some, some patchouli oil, I think is what it's called. Because if you're ever around him, he's got this, he smells good. I told him. He's in my car. I said, brother, boy, that was strong. Brother David, I can taste it. <laughs> brother David, you, uh, you, uh, you smell good. He said, you like that, Pastor Jerry? I said, yeah, I do, man. He said, I get you some. And it came in the mail. And I read about it. It's expensive, man. It's like $50, $60, dollars for a little tube of that stuff. Just, and it, it just, just take a little drop. Man, don't put too much. 
just a drop here and a drop here, and you're going to be fine all day long like David Huff. <laughs> but if you break it and you open it up and you let it out, now, now it's going to emit all over the place. And you could smell this perfume. You think this is strong. Imagine the perfume she had. The, the alabaster, how it filled the fragrance, filled the room. Amen. There was such an, an extravagance for that moment. That jar of perfume, it was meant to be drop by drop. It was meant to last for years, perhaps even for a lifetime. But in a moment of utter devotion, the woman poured it on the head of Jesus. And I've seen this happen in my life, your life, where you're in a place and you just go, you know what? I can't help it. I've got to do something crazy. I've I, I got to celebrate. I've got to be excited about I got. I got to give something away. I've got to be a blessing. Generosity is flowing out of me. And again, I tell you over and over, God, if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. Amen. This is not about tithing, by the way. Tithing, my tithing is the most minimal of anything you can do in the body of Christ. Yeah, I know at times you can give an offering, but, but tithing, tithing is the, is the simple thing we do. I'm talking about doing something crazy, like, like somebody giving a, a, a friend of mine a, a Harley. That's crazy. But he said, I don't need it. Uh, somebody give away a vehicle. To somebody says that's in need. They just had that moment of generosity that came over them. Amen. Uh, somebody gives a check to pay off the church. Something like that. that that's, that's crazy sounding. But yet it happens and, and people are moved that way. Love does not stop nicely to calculate the less or the more. Listen to me. Love does not stop to work out how little it can respectively give. With a kind of extravagant love, gives everything it has and never counts the cost. Calculation is never any part of love. I have to be careful when I go to buy something for maybe one of my daughters or boys or my wife. You go, what, what's that cost? <laughs> Many of you that were married, you know, that are married, you know, you know what I'm talking about here. You go and you get that wedding band. You know, you don't. A smart husband already knows the price and what he has in his pocket before he asks, what's that cost? Amen. It's something about being able to just say, look, I love you this much. And I'm going to release it this much. Third, love knows well that there are certain... D, stay with me. I knew I was going to strike a chord there. Love knows well that there are certain moments in life which come and which do not return. Now listen to me. I've said for years, opportunity is always knocking. But there are certain opportunities that only come once. They only, they, they, it hits right there in the moment of the lifetime. There were endless and limitless opportunities for Mary to do something for Jesus. Matter of fact, let me say, endless and limitless opportunities to help the poor. But if Mary had not seized that moment to make known her love for Jesus, the opportunity would never would have come again. There are moments in life which do not come a second time. Impulses to devotion, impulses to reformation, impulses to decision, it, to enter your heart. And if they are not acted on at once, they may never return. Love is ever ready to seize the moment and declare itself as Mary did. She couldn't back away. She, I, 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 in, in my mind's eye, I hear the disciples and Jesus, and they're all in there talking. And, and she, she looks, and it, 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 she's the one that ran out and met Jesus and said, my brother has died. And Jesus said, he's not, he's not he's, it's okay. It's okay. And then Jesus begins to weep. The shortest prayer, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept and he began to weep. Now, this is not long after that. So she looks into the living room and she sees not only her and Martha preparing, but here is Lazarus, her brother. And she had an affection for her brother. She loved her brother or she would have never ran out and tried to get Jesus to do something for him. Amen. So there was a, so she sees it and says, you know what? This is a moment. This is a moment that I should, I, I want to share. And she goes and gets the alabaster. And some even consider it a, a, a an ointment that you would put on somebody before, before you put them into a tomb. So if I'm going to bury someone, I'm going to put this on them and put them into the tomb. But something has Sherlock Holmes here. What, Pastor, what are you talking about? Well, Lazarus, when it got to the tomb, the scripture says, they said, don't go there, Lord. By now he stinks. The question is, after three days, why was he smelling? Why was he already stinking if you put the alabaster or the burial ointment on someone? Why would he? Because Jesus says, she saved this for my burial. 
Why would he stink? I'm just pointing at you. No, no particular reason. Why would he stink? Why would he smell unless somebody didn't give up the burial ointment or get enough on him to be a blessing to him? You follow me? So there's Lazarus sitting out there, and he's already heard the word that he stunk. Amen. He's sitting there, and Mary's saying, you know what? I probably should have gave that to Lazarus, but I, 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 I saved it. And here's that moment. Years ago, I preached a sermon called, and it's out of the same text. Give me my flowers now. Don't wait till I'm dead to do it. Amen. If you're going to be a blessing, go ahead and do it now. If you see somebody else that needs to be blessed, go ahead and do it now. Don't, don't wait till they're gone to put flowers up because you feel guilty that you weren't able to be a blessing to them when they were alive. So she goes and gets the alabaster. Boy, she comes in there to Jesus, and she pulls the lid off. Oh, yeah, she did. Oh, yeah, she did. It wasn't just a drop. It wasn't just a drop. She, it, it's closed, dude. We're good. <laughs> and she began to pour that all over his body. Not only did she do that, she reached up and pulled the pin out of her hair. And she rubbed his feet with tears and hair. And it emitted and it filled the room. There are times in this house that I can sense the alabaster in the air. Yet somebody broke a vase. Somebody, somebody showed. Sometimes it's, I was preaching Sunday, second service. I looked down, and a gentleman was crying. Never met the man before. He was weeping. He man, gave the altar call. He gave his life to Jesus. And immediately when church was over, he didn't turn to go get a hot dog. He came right at me. His phone in his hand, he said, Pastor, he said, I needed this today. He said, my wife's in the hospital. Will you pray for her? Amen. I said, sure. And I turned around talking to somebody right here. I turned back around here. Here she is. <laughs> he said, I'm at the front at the altar. So I'm praying for her on the phone. Amen. You never know when a vase is going to get broke or how somebody's going to react or something's going to happen. So what, what the disciples fail to see is love puts into the world of fragrance, which time can't remove. It can't remove it. Time can't remove this fragrance. Amen. There are times, H, that we've done stuff. This is talk about going to Augusta, Georgia. Amen. And Boudreaux getting saved in church and us selling our golf tickets to the masters and coming home. Time can't take that away. Amen. It emits an aroma. Dwayne jumping in the swimming pool at night in the dark. Amen. As soon as we get there, it was wrong, but he did it. I love, I love my memories as I go down the, the lane of, of, of bike rides and things that we've done together and great events this church has had. Amen. You, you look back over it and you realize that love puts into the world a fragrance which time can't remove. What happened on Sunday to me was, uh, was a love offering. People offering their love to come out on Saturday and work and get things on Sunday. And we do that year in and year out. We've done it for car shows. We've done it for revivals. We've done it for conferences. And then sometimes it just happens in here on a regular Sunday morning. Amen. That love begins to emit through the air. To this day, the story of Mary's devotion moves the heart. It moves the heart. We're disgusted with Judas's action. Yet, 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 some of us would be like Judas. We would have said, couldn't we have used that? Could we have taken that money and used it somewhere else? Why are you going to send these kids to can pastor? It's going to cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for all these kids to run off to Kentucky for four or five days and eat McDonald's and come back and tell us about what they saw that's already in the Bible. You know what's going to happen? Yeah, that's right. It's going to be a memory that's going to change their life. Amen. And I'll say it again. Love will put into the world a fragrance which time can't remove. Come on. They'll catch hold of it, and they'll never forget it. Camp is the same way. To this day, Mary's devotion moves us. A lovely deed is not only a thing of the moment. It leaves something in the world which time cannot take away. Love adds a permanent legacy of loveliness to life. Before I got here tonight, uh, and, and songs will do this. I'll hear a song. Somebody pop up. I call Verlene. Some of you know Miss Verlene. I did her husband's funeral night back in 1996, I believe is when it was. And Verlene's still kicking, still rolling. And she's shocked. I could hear it in her voice. Oh, my pastor. She got so excited to hear, just hear my. And we get talking. We go down memory lane a little bit. We smell the roses that we've enjoyed in life. And we come back to reality. 
Amen. I know some of you don't know her, but I'm just telling you, these are the things that I do. Love puts that fragrance in. Jim Elliott said this. He has no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He has no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. There's a book called Through the Gates of Splendor. Jim Elliott was a missionary. Him and some friends landed on a little island. Amen. When they got there, they were attacked by the natives, cannibal natives. They killed Jim Elliott. After that, his wife and the wives of those men went back to that island and won them natives to Jesus. Can I ask you a question? Is that something we would do? Is there love in our hearts so deep that we could go back and, and win to Christ the very men that killed our husbands, our wives on an island like that? And yet they did it. This is through the gates of splendor. And it was Jim that taught all of those this one statement. He has no fool who gives up what he cannot keep, but he gain what he cannot lose. Amen. You've got to learn how to live life and let some things go. Mark chapter 8, verse 35, for whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Proverbs eleven twenty four tells us about the stingy spirit that will tend to poverty. It will bring you there. One man gives freely, yet gains not even more. Another with oaths unduly, but comes to poverty. When Mary released the ointment, she's never been forgotten. Amen. And even though it was a year's wages, it was her love and devotion to Christ. Amen. It, cha it, it literally changes for thousands of years now. People have looked back and realized this woman's life changed. Th if I want to compare myself, I'm not going to compare myself to a Pentecostal, a Catholic, or a Baptist. I look here in John chapter 12 and say to myself, Jerry, you got a long way to go. you got a long way to go, man. Amen. Amen. You, you, you have that. One man gives freely, yet gains more. Has that ever blown your mind how, how people, that certain people give, 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 and they keep getting? And it keeps coming back to them over and over again. Yet, amen, another one withholds, hangs on, becomes stingy, and comes to poverty. And their, their houses fall down, their vehicles break down. That word withhold, restrain, refrain, refuse to observe and hold back when you could be releasing and letting go. You know, I can tell you guys, and I don't mind sharing this with you tonight because you all know me and love me. But according to statistics about American churches, when it comes to giving, 20% of members give 80% of all the funds. It's called the 20-80 principle. 20% give 80%. Listen to me. 30% of the members give the other 20%. And we'll say it again. 20% of members give 80% of the funds. 30% of members give the other 20% that maintains the missions, and the, the, the mission, the missions, all the things to the church. And then 50%, at least 50, 50% of the members give nothing, ever. Wow. You know, that is not correct for this church. But we still got a long way to go. But it's still not correct. Amen. Listen, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, Get all you can, save all you can, give all you can. I love that. I love that statement. Amen. Amen. Get all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Amen. I think we say get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. <laughs> well, at least I think that's what most storage buildings look like. Get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the lid. Martin Luther said, I have tried to keep things in my hands and lost them. But what I have given into God's hands, I still possess. It's a deliberate action. I close with this scripture here. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 6. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or, what, or whether both will do equally well. So sow your seed, and then, and then stay after it. Be effective. Keep, keep working on it. Have a deliberate action. So here's the thought I want to close with. Remind yourself that like Lazarus, you and I have been resurrected. We're sitting in that living room with his disciples in Mary's and Martha's. So remind yourself that like Lazarus, you've been resurrected. Serve like Martha. Everybody serve like Martha. Be grateful to worship and give like Mary. And don't forget there lurks an ungrateful Judas in all of us that has to be dealt with.
because there's always a Judas that wants to rise up. Father, I love you. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for this memorial that the woman Mary gave to you. Oh, I bet her hair lingered even at the time when you were on the cross. I bet wherever she walked, people could smell and knew this woman had a devotion toward her Lord. God, let us be those people. As we leave here tonight with the smell of Old Spice on us, remind us, God, that we too can emit an odor in here, God, that is pleasing to you with our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 H, if you'd help me with the offering.